All right. Welcome everyone to today's Business uh, uh, to Believe uh, meeting or event, as, uh, as we're like calling it sometimes. We have a special guest today, and I'm going to pass it over to Don and I have Don introduce him as Don is a good friend of his. Great. Thanks, Bruno. So welcome everyone to uh, tonight's um, meeting event. We uh, have had this in planning for, well, um, about 18 months, uh, I guess. Um, Professor Mike Daly was actually scheduled to speak at our April 2020 RTB meeting and uh, was, was a much anticipated live speaker when uh, COVID hit and we had to cancel all our meetings actually at uh, People's Church. And as you all know, we have not met there since. So uh, I've been pestering Mike in the background to if you'd be willing to do it on Zoom. And uh, so tonight we're, we're very privileged and I'm very privileged to introduce Mike. Um, he is a professor at York University uh, in the Department of Earth and Space Science and Engineering. Uh, he holds the York Research Chair in Planetary Science, as well as being the director for the Center for Research in Earth and Space Science, commonly known as CRESS. Um, in terms of his background and uh, education, Mike completed his, uh, his uh, bachelor's in engineering physics uh, from Queen's University, and he did his master's in engineering and uh, his PhD at McMaster University. Sorry, I couldn't resist. Um, his research and his development work is primarily focused on optical instrumentation. And Mike's gonna explain uh, a number of those instruments uh, that he has helped to develop for planetary mapping and Im imaging. And his work has been a critical part of Canada's collaboration with NASA on two specific missions that I'm sure Mike's gonna tell us more about. Uh, the first one was for the Phoenix lander on Mars, and this was the first time that Canada had any instruments on another planet. And uh, secondly, uh, he is the lead scientist for the laser altimeter on the OSIRIS-REx mission, and, and Mike will explain uh, what all that is. So without further ado, uh, Mike, I'm going to hand it over to you. Do you want to uh, do you want to break uh, afterwards? Sorry, what's I your preference? You broke. Up. I was just saying, would you like to have like break your talk? Is your talk in two parts or just one part and then take Q&A at the end? No, my, my talk is mostly on the uh, the more recent mission, the OSIRIS-REx laser altimeter. And I think there's few enough if we want to handle it fairly uh, Informally, I could take questions in the middle. I don't mind uh, being interrupted. And then anything I don't talk about or anything else you want to talk about that I might know about, I'd be happy to handle that rather informally. Um, awesome. Um, thank you, Mike. I guess, I guess just to give you, thank you for the introduction, just to give you another little uh, bit of connection. Um, so I, I, I met Don actually through, through his son, uh, Robin, who I met on a charity bike ride one time and we were talking and he said that he had done engineering physics and I said how can someone like me be a pastor because <laughs> we both did engineering physics and I am the furthest thing from a pastor in terms of my uh, ability to interact with people I like interacting with things so uh, so that's the connection anyway I'm happy to be here um, with you all I guess I'll just give you a little bit of uh, church background and we talk a little bit about that at the end but uh, as I as I said to uh, to John earlier, my my church background's uh, Free Methodist. Um, I live in Burlington. I don't currently attend a Free Methodist church because there isn't one close by. But I am the vice chair on a on a Free Methodist um, charity. Um, we we run a campground with some some kids camps, so I'm on the board of directors there. Um, so still lots of lots of connections um, and and maybe generally a theological alignment. All right, so as Don said, um, we do a lot of this work through our research center, which is as old as I am. So um, it's one of the older ones at York and I'll, I'll leave you to guess its exact age, but it's the Center for Research in Earth and Space Science. Um, now, let me just, 
You can see the uh, title slide fine. Yeah, we can see it fine, Mike. All right. Okay, so as you may or may not know, Cyrus Rex is a NASA mission that had the job of going to um, near Earth asteroid. And uh, like many of the uh, contributions Canada has done in the last uh, 20 or so years to planetary science, um, most of them have been with instruments on NASA missions. So I've had the privilege of starting a couple of them and um, seeing them uh, both successful. Um, so this is the latest one that we really just finished up the, the main part of the mission um, last fall. So it's still pretty fresh and I'm still busy writing papers on the results. Okay, so we'll talk a little bit about the mission, why we chose the asteroid, a uh, fair bit about the, the instrument and, and the results of the instrument, which are pretty spectacular. And then the objective of this mission was to grab a sample and that sample's on its way back to Earth. And we call that whole process uh, that went on last um, late last year uh, tag touch and go sampling to try and get this uh, idea of landing out of people's heads because it was a very slow motion thing more akin to a spacecraft docking and not the you know seven minutes of terror people frequently uh, think of when they think about Mars landings. Okay, so what's OSIRIS-REx? Well, every space mission has an acronym and we're no different. So the OSIRIS really contains all of the objectives of the mission inside its acronym. So it's about uh, origins, organics in the early solar system, it's uh, spectral interpretation, how you uh, can go and ground truth uh, and understand one asteroid and help to use that knowledge and connect it back through Earth-based observations and then use Earth-based observations, use that information to better understand Earth-based observations of other uh, solar system bodies. Uh, resource identification. So this really is about, uh, about water. Security, this is a near-Earth asteroid. Uh, it does have a small probability of impacting us as do other asteroids, so better understanding the asteroid population and their physical makeup and their orbits um, will help us to, to, to mitigate that. And then, as I said, the main objective was to, to grab a sample. And so that's all about exploring the regolith first with standoff instruments and then going down and grabbing it and bringing it back, uh, some of it back to Earth so that we can uh, study it with uh, more complex instruments in our laboratories. Okay, so just a uh, a little bit more detail on these. Number one, return and analyze a sample. So actually the mission's not complete until some initial analysis happens through 2023 and 2024. Um, create maps of the asteroid, and that's a lot of what uh, my role was. <clears throat> Document the, the sample site or the tag site. Um, again, we had a major part of that. Um, Measure orbit deviations. I'll talk a little bit more about that later on in the slide, but that relates to the security objective. And then the comparative telescope based observations is the spectral interpretation and, and uh, the bit I was just discussing about helping understand the broader asteroid population. Okay, so here was the timeline. Uh, maybe I'll start with an earlier timeline. First started working on this in 2008. So that gives you a, a little bit of an idea and the sample will come back in 2023. Um, so these are not short commitments. I actually started working on this when I was still uh, employed at a company and I put the um, concept for this instrument together and then I left to be a professor and, and picked up the, uh, the lead science role. So we launched in September of 2016. Um, we encountered the asteroid in October 2018, really we got close enough to start um, using OLA in December of that year. We stayed in close proximity uh, with Bennu for up to, I should really replace this with the exact number, um, but it was something approaching this number, um, probably a little longer than that actually in, in the way it ended up. And this was really sort of unprecedented and let us really understand the asteroid at a level of detail that it's really never been done before and also understand its orbit because we were there in proximity with it for quite a while. 
And then we had to obtain 60 grams of regolith. So this does not sound like a big sample that, come, that uh, is coming back, but um, it really is quite a bit in terms of what we can do with modern scientific instrumentation. So if we got 60 grams, most of it we could actually um, store for future generations and we could get all the science we wanted out of a, out of a fraction of that 60 grams. In reality, I think we're gonna get much more than that. And then um, before the talk, I had a question about this. The whole spacecraft comes um, back in the vicinity to Earth and then it ejects a little uh, capsule. That capsule comes through the atmosphere and lands in Utah and that will happen in 2023. And there'll be a mad rush to recover it and get it to Johnson Space Center uh, where it will be curated and um, samples will be uh, divvied up for the OSIRIS-REx science team of which um, I'm and other Canadians are a part of, uh, but then Canada actually gets 4% of this sample for its future curation. Uh, so it'll be our first pristine sample return from, from space. So here's a cartoon. I'll show you uh, a little later some um, additional pictures of, uh, of this uh, spacecraft. Um, it gives you an idea of the scale though, about two meters on each side. Solar arrays are eight and a half square meters. Um, it's, there's no nuclear uh, in this one. It, close enough to the sun, we could use solar arrays, lithium ion batteries, kind of standard um, technologies at this point that helps keep the cost reasonable. And then you can't see it in this picture because the science deck is uh, on the side where that sampling arm you can see below the uh, spacecraft comes out of. Um, and that's where the sample return capsule and our, all the instruments are. That sample return capsule is the same as has previously been used on a mission called Stardust. So uh, it has gotten to Earth safely before and we'll trust it'll, it'll do the same again. Okay, so we've talked about this a little bit. So this is what the, the sampling device um, looks like. This caused us uh, a fair bit of, uh, uh, of work in hindsight and it turns out it was uh, exceptionally um, successful. But the way this works is it's kind of like a reverse vacuum cleaner. So there's no atmosphere to suck up. So you have to take your own and you, we have some ultra pure nitrogen bottles and when the sampling device touched the surface of the asteroid, uh, we blew the bottles, it blew nitrogen into the surface and blew, uh, if you can, can you see my mouse or not? No, we can't see your mouse, Mike. Okay, well, you can, I think it's fairly evident, you know, the, the blue uh, lines are the nitrogen and you can see all the particles that are flowing up into the collection device. So this means two things. It means that that uh, device, which is about the size of a pie plate, needed to sit on the surface of Bennu in a reasonably flat manner. And that we actually had to have lots of loose regolith in the location that we chose so that there would actually be particles to blow up into the collection device. And um, really we're talking about things that are below you know, two or three centimeters in size is, is kind of the, the limiting sizes that we, we anticipated. So when we talk about uh, sample sites, you'll, you'll have to remember some of those constraints. This uh, whole process was uh, very quick, just a few seconds. Here's what it looks like. So this is a poster. Um, you can get an idea of the scale on the bottom right of the sampling device. Um, you, what's not maybe apparent there is inside that ring, um, there's some mylar flaps that actually close up after regolith is blown in there. You can see in the, on the left side of the screen where the person is looking up at the device on the end of the arm, uh, you can see nitrogen bottles near his right right hand, and you get a sense of scale of the of the whole device. And of course, in the schematic, you can see the nitrogen bottles. I think rather easily at the the top. So there's a lot of testing done um, on this device. Um, I was wishing for a ride, but I, I didn't get one. There was even some uh, zero g testing of this device, and the you know the vomit comet is the colloquial name. These parabolic flights. 
Um, still on my bucket list to get a chance to fly on one of those. Um, a little movie. Okay, I, I, there's no sound, right? Just to be clear, just for sure, I think there's no sound, so I'll narrate. All right, so as we got close to Bennu um, and close to the sampling time, we extended the arm and that's all the sampling took. So again, this is an artist's conception, but you can see how fast. This is actually a sampling measurement. So we knew the moment of inertia of the spacecraft before, and here we're measuring it after the sampling. Um, and this actually meant we had about a 90 gram uncertainty on the measurement. So if we didn't measure 150 grams, we weren't sure we got 60. Uh, there was a little bit of visual inspection. And then there's a sample canister around all the other instruments. Got stowed. This all happened in the vicinity of Bennu. Closed up and uh, doesn't get opened again until uh, it lands in the Utah, Utah Test and Tracking Range, Utah, UTTR. Um, spun up and ejected into the Earth's atmosphere. And that's what's going to happen in 2023. Okay, next science goal. So creating maps of the asteroid. Here, really, we have instruments that map. Uh, we have cameras. We have the LIDAR for, for morphology. We have spectrometers. Um, both visual, visible spectrometers, infrared spectrometer, and uh, an X-ray spectrometer. Um, so we spent a lot of time characterizing the asteroid, kind of getting closer and closer to it, characterizing it at a higher and higher resolution. Uh, for some of the instruments, as we got to higher resolution, you know, the coverage um, got, uh, you know, it was more difficult to get global coverage, but we focused more on the, on the actual sampling sites. Um, so lots of map types, spectral maps, image maps, elemental maps from the X-ray spectrometer, topographic maps. Those are the ones I spent most of my time doing. Um, and all of these, will, will, I'll show you all the instruments. Okay, so, so here's a cartoon of the actual instrument deck. So um, the, the big conical shape at the bottom of the poster on the line drawing of the spacecraft, that's actually the communications array. So the smaller conical shape in the middle of the science deck uh, in between all the instruments, that's the actual sample return capsule where you saw the sample being stowed. And so um, Ola on the left there is the Canadian instrument. Ovir is at the top. That's the visible and infrared spectrometer. So from um, a few hundred uh, nanometers out to almost, I think it was three and a half or four microns. And then the uh, thermal emission spectrometer picks up from four microns and goes out into the many tens of microns. And then a camera suite, which consisted of a, of a number of cameras. So for the cartoon, you can see pictures of the, the instruments in, in reality. I think not all of these pictures I'm showing you are the actual flight. I can tell the picture that's on this from, from Ola is actually, uh, it might be the flight model, but it's not the flight model with the final in its final configuration, because I'll show you another picture and you'll see the, the cover looks a little differently than, than, than we see there. It gives you a sense of scale, remembering that the spacecraft's about two meters by two meters in terms of its science deck. Mike, it might be helpful just for the audience if you explained what a spectrometer is. Okay, well, we'll, we'll, we'll do that right here. Um, so here are the, the two spectrometers on the mission. So all they do is they, they collect reflected light from the surface of the asteroid, and they essentially measure as a function of the, the wavelength of the light or the color of the light, if you're in the visible range, uh, how much light is coming off the surface. So because we know the solar spectrum going in, uh, we can infer the absorption of the of the surface material, and from that we can often um, sort out what the actual mineralogy is that that we're seeing on the surface. So um, the one on the top right, uh, this was 
done by NASA Goddard Space Flight Center based on some previous instruments. And it uh, just uses a linear variable filter. So a, a filter that has a, a varied transmission window across it uh, that blocks, that allows through only a, a, a narrow bit of light. Um, and then that a, a filter right next to it changes its passband, it's called a little bit more. And eventually you build up that whole spectrum from about 400 nanometers um, out, you know, the visible ends about 700 or so, but this one goes out um, into the, into the mid infrared around four microns. And then the one uh, below where the uh, purple glove is, uh, is touching this, this has some heritage from some Mars missions. So if you uh, look at the what's called the test instruments on Mars. There's a mini test and then some, some an orbital test. This is a thermal emission spectrometer, and it uses what's called the Michelson configuration, where you split the light into two different paths and you vary a path length. And from that, you can actually achieve the same kind of um, measurement of the different wavelengths of light that are. Uh, entering it as you can using a more conventional filter that might be easier to conceptualize. And so this, uh, you know, one of the things besides some mineralogy we get out of thermal emission spectrometer is we get some understanding of how um, quickly or slowly the surface cools with respect to the incident solar radiation that can give us some understanding of the porosity and the you know, heat capacity of the surface. Um, so that it, it gives, um, which, which was very important to doing things like assessing the amount of, uh, sorry, assessing whether we had regolith on the surface or not. Okay, so you can see here, this is the visible infrared one. And if you look at the picture on the bottom right, you can see the linear variable filter and it's kind of, um, I think probably the colors on there are meant for illustrative purposes so you can get the idea, but you can see here that, you know, one portion of it would pass more of the red, another portion would pass the green, another portion would pass the blue. Um, and here we go into, uh, into wavelengths further out in the infrared that we can't see. But that's, that's the idea of, uh, of this instrument. So this is really focused on mineral and organic compounds. And here's the, the test one. I think it's much less clear how this one works. So, so we'll leave it. Um, Arizona State University. If you look at the bottom, uh, this one gives you a sense of the um, here in, in wavelength and frequency of the of where we're interrogating what light is coming from the surface of the asteroid. So again, it's all it's all um, reflected or in thermal. Sometimes it's absorbed and then re-emitted at different wavelengths just by heat coming off the surface of the of the asteroid. The top right there, there's a little cartoon uh, that is imagining. Um, this wasn't real data. This is imagining beforehand what uh, the asteroid would look like to to this instrument, where you see. Uh, things are much hotter at the equator and much cooler at the poles. And then we have the camera system. So uh, three cameras here. Uh, Polycam, it's, it's the one with the, the um, uh, largest focal length, so the narrowest field of view. It's used both uh, from furthest away from the asteroid because it can you know, blow the asteroid into a larger picture, but then it has a focus mechanism and it also gave us the most detail we got from the surface. So a uh, very small area on the surface interrogated, but really had us able to look at the sample sites in very high detail and try and get an understanding whether we had those two or three centimeter particles that we needed to suck into the sampling mechanism. And then MapCam, MapCam was used um, to, to map the whole asteroid at kind of medium ranges. And then the, the SAM cam was the sample cam. That's the, the camera that did those. Uh, uh, you saw the cartoon of looking at the actual uh, tag device to see if we had sample or not. 
ping. So this gives you an idea of what those cameras look like. Um, they kind of look like periscopes, but they're not. These are just baffles, so they they don't they don't look out the side like you might imagine a periscope looking. They just look um, straight up. But the the baffle is uh, built that way to to cut out as much stray light um, as possible. And and remem remembering we. We're in control of the orientation of the spacecraft, so you can you can baffle a little more on on a side where you think you're going to have more stray light than others. Uh, we did help this instrument. Yep. Somebody uh, in the chat asked a question. They want to know how close uh, they the, you'd have to be to the asteroid to be able to collect the spectrometer data and and these pictures with the cameras. Uh, We'll talk about the mission profile a little bit uh, later in here. I can give you the, the gory details. Okay. Um, so uh, what this wasn't really planned from the beginning, but um, it turned out we actually used the laser altimeter. We made some changes to allow um, distance to be passed to the camera so the camera could adjust its focus and make sure that it got good images uh, on every pass. So. So we were uh, helpful Canadians. Okay, this is what MapCam looks like. A lot of these um, space cameras that you'll uh, see, many of them don't have um, what's called, a, well, the standard version is a bare filter. So they don't have little red, green, and blue filters on every pixel, but they have a filter wheel. So they take multiple pictures in succession if you want color, uh, turning the filter wheel each time. That gives us the highest resolution because you're not compromising your uh, color resolution and your spatial resolution. Um, also lets you put in a few extra filters you know, and, and get some spectral information and not just the color information from having a, a normal red, green, blue um, filter. So the filter wheel here is uh, up in the top right of this um, poster. Okay, I said extreme short range imaging. It's hard to build a camera that has both extreme short range and extreme long range. So I'm sure you're, any of you are photographers understand that trade. And this, uh, I actually haven't spent too much time looking at the data from this instrument. Um, this was actually a student project. Uh, so it's not one of the, uh, it wasn't one of the, the, I'm trying to find a way to, to phrase this without disparaging a very useful uh, instrument that was, uh, it, it, it's, it was very well done by the students. But let's say it wasn't one of the, the prime instruments that we needed to fulfill the, the main mission goals. Um, so it was a student project along the way and, and the project was won by a combined MIT Harvard team. And this is really about looking at the chemistry of the surface, the elemental composition. All right. This is uh, what I've spent lots of my time doing. This is Ola. So, you know, you're, you're talking about a couple of bread boxes in size. Um, if you remember the picture I showed you of Ola from the poster, uh, you'll note that on the, on the right-hand side box, the top of Ola was smooth in that picture. This is actually the flight model before it got um, sent to Lockheed Martin and integrated with the spacecraft. So the, the, that was the actual final configuration. Um, it was changed to uh, improve the uh, resistance of the instrument to vibration um, and the, the, the um, at a loss for words tonight, it seems. The most critical vibration is actually from the launch itself. Um, so instruments are tested to make sure they'll survive launch. We did have some minor issues during testing. And so there were some de design changes. The biggest one being this uh, new lid with the honeycomb structure uh, to improve its um, resistance to vibration. So um, the, the portion of the instrument on the right was mounted on top of the science deck. That was the portion labeled Ola in the, one of the other pictures I've showed you. The portion on the left was mounted underneath, so you couldn't see that in those pictures. The, the two lasers for Ola and, and the optics are all in the right-hand side. And on the left-hand side, it's power supplies, 
some control electronics, um, the single board computer that you know handles the uh, collection of the data and the um, passing of that data to the spacecraft, and the timing circuitry that actually measures the um, difference in time between the outgoing laser pulse and the incoming laser pulse. So maybe I should, I should have, uh, let me just, let me just give you all um, from the other question, maybe you're all not familiar with, with what a LIDAR is, but essentially a LIDAR is a, is a light radar. So um, LI for light and, and, and uh, DAR, just like radar. So we send out a pulse of light, it reflects off something, we measure the incoming pulse of light and the time difference between them gives us a distance. Now, OLA is, um, so both those pulses of light come out of this aperture that you see that's tilted a little bit uh, on, on the top of the right-hand unit. Um, near the, the middle comes the outgoing pulse and then the, the received pulse. Um, gets collected by this uh, 75 centimeter aperture or so. And what makes OLA really special, and I think maybe I have some of that in the next slide. Okay, so uh, here again, you can see OLA. Uh, the top picture is OLA being tested in, in what's called thermal vacuum testing. So this is actually a vacuum chamber uh, almost directly below my office, about four flights down. And here's where we test its uh, ability to withstand the changing thermal environment and in vacuum. So we make sure that the instrument can manage its own um, heat dissipation, you know, even though it's in vacuum and doesn't have the benefit of uh, conduction or convection. The, the red um, cover there, uh, often red covers are on instruments um, and the red is essentially removed before a flight. So you don't usually build flight hardware with red that flies. Anything red should, should generally come off. And uh, okay, so what makes OLA special? Well, OLA was designed to get to, to start operating when we were about seven kilometers from the surface of this very dark asteroid. So Bennu, you know, what's behind me, it looks quite uh, light and it looks a little moonlight. I've played with the, uh, I've taken liberties there to, to make it visible behind me in my image, I mean. Um, it, it, it's about 4% reflective. So it's more like a chunk of charcoal in it than it is what's, what's behind me. That looks more like a 20% lunar surface. So you can imagine you send this little pulse of light out it goes seven kilometers, it reflects off something that only gives 4% of it back in all, essentially all directions. And then a very few photons come back and you have to measure those and figure out the time difference between those. So to accommodate um, that, we had two lasers inside this. We had one laser that operated at 100 measurements per second, which is still pretty fast, more typical, uh, lidars that have flown uh, operate sort of in the one to 10 hertz range. Now they're typically much further than seven kilometers. So, you know, when you're a little closer, you can have a fairly compact laser and, and put out more pulses and, and still measure them. But then we have this 10,000 measurement per second laser, which really got, well, it got the data that's again behind me on my, my screen background. And that's just, you know, sort of an unprecedented rate for any kind of planetary LIDAR. And we started operating with that one when we we're closer to 700 meters from the sur surface. So we got very close to the surface of Bennu. Now, you know, if you, if you had this in a Mars or an Earth orbit, your, your ground track, we call it, or the, the, you know, the orbital velocity uh, is something on the order of you know, a, a few seven kilometers per second. So, you know, even at 10,000 measurements per second, you're not putting these measurements on top of one another. But in a, around Bennu, the, the orbital velocity is more like 20-ish centimeters per second. So you can just imagine that if we measured at 10,000 uh, kilohertz and we couldn't point 
anything, whether it be the spacecraft or the instrument, we would have a very dense, very narrow line of measurements all along the surface of the asteroid, and we wouldn't get a lot of new information with every shot. And we really couldn't be driving the spacecraft uh, quick enough to make use of it either. So underneath that aperture that you saw, the, the window on the top of Ola, the first thing that's encountered is a, a mirror that can actually uh, move in, in uh, two, on two axes, and we can actually point the laser to make sure that every measurement that we took is essentially seeing a different piece of Bennu, and we're making use of every one of those 10,000 measurements per second. Um, so we got about 1.3 centimeter or so uh, vertical resolution on the surface, and we had spots that were on the order of five to 10 centimeters in, in diameter. So that's the kind of resolution that's in this model behind me. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about Bennu so you can get a sense of how that relates to the overall size. So it was really a pretty cool instrument and, and and the results, I think, speak for themselves. Okay, so our portion of this um, was really, a lot of it was focused on documenting the sample site. So we have these really cool global models and we have all the science we got out of those, but remember the number one goal of this mission is to grab that sample and bring it back to Earth. So we spent a lot of effort uh, looking at uh, maps of the sample site and uh, trying to, um, understand whether it was safe to, to actually grab the sample. And I think we'll speak a little bit more about that. Um, we'll speak about this too. So there's, you know, people often ask me, why is it we don't know whether something's gonna hit us or not? Can we not predict that? Because, you know, we're used to planets. We have a fairly good understanding of, of um, what's happening with orbits. Um, what's what's the big deal here? Because you know we hear something quoted. This is now a bit of an old slide. So this is Bennu before it got named Bennu. It was named uh, 1999 RQ36, and um, here we have an impact uh, probability over over this um, span of oh, I think this one is it's probably over all known. Uh, close passes, you know, which might be a couple hundred years. And so an impact probability of 7.1 times 10 to the minus four, it's very small, but why is it always a probability? And that's because asteroid orbits are, are difficult to predict. And, and one of the reasons for this is called the Yarkovsky effect. And we'll talk a little bit more about it here. So um, hopefully this will be clear, but you can imagine, so this little cartoon is, the asteroid that looks like the, some things in my descriptions here, I date myself, but you, I look around, I think you all know what a record is. So it kind of looks like a record and the record's spinning, but this is really a sphere uh, spinning. So you can imagine that there's a day and night on the asteroid and there's, you know, a, a dawn and a dusk. So the asteroid, a portion of the asteroid comes from its night, starts heating it up as it goes through its day. And as it, gets around and is in the shade again, it starts radiating its energy back into deep space uh, and starts cooling off as it goes around until it hits the morning again and starts heating up again. So when something radiates out into deep space, you know, there's, there's energy and there's momentum being transferred. So when something is hotter, there's more momentum being uh, transferred into deep space than when something's cooler. So just the difference in the asteroid surface temperature between when it just enters into its night and, and, and when it's at the end of its night is significant. And, and that those differences in momentum actually in part of force the asteroid, which will change its, its orbit. And depending on which direction it um, spins relative to its orbital direction will, de will um, determine whether the, the um, orbit contracts or, or gets larger. So to try and predict this, you have to know things like the asteroid's optical properties, how much light does it absorb, how quick does it emit, what its thermal properties are, um, how quickly, uh, you know, how much heat capacity there is, um, 
the technical term is called thermal inertia, but essentially how much energy there is and how fast it'll, it'll radiate uh, back into deep space. And the morphology of the asteroid also matters. So we were able to stay near the asteroid for very many days, uh, having a really good understanding of the spacecraft position and having a really good understanding of the uh, position of the asteroid relative to the spacecraft. We have very good measurements of its rotation rate and its sizes. And so our ability is to, to understand the effect of the Yarkovsky, the Yarkovsky effects change in, its, in the orbit of Bennu is now extremely high as long as Bennu doesn't continue to change its surface too much. There are also related effects. Um, there's a related effect called YORP, which is similar to the Yarkovsky effect, but it's not how the orbit changes, it's how the spin rate changes. So, you know, one of the reasons why Yarkovsky is important to, to understand um, what's happened with the asteroid population and how we get these near Earth asteroids that have a chance of impacting us, uh, you, you, can, you can see here. So what this is, is if you take the um, <clears throat> radius, you know, out to the asteroid belt. So, you know, the middle of the asteroid belt is about 2.7. Uh, times the, dist the mean distance between the Earth and the Sun. So that's what an AU is. And so th this is a histogram. This is a histogram of the asteroid, the known asteroid population in the asteroid belt. So the, the further to the right you go on the, on the X axis, the further away from the Sun you are. And the vertical axis is the number of asteroids that we know of at that distance. So you notice that there are these um, gaps. And these gaps correspond to resonances with the major planets, mostly Jupiter. And so it's thought that what happens is you have an asteroid and it's in one of these places where there are lots of other asteroids. And the Yarkovsky effect can slowly move that asteroid into one of these resonances with one of the planets. And that resonance can kick the asteroid out into uh, a location where it can cross the Earth's orbit and cause a security hazard to us. So this is a, this, this is a, a mechanism that's important to understand the security aspect, but also one of the things we do with an asteroid like Bennu is we look at it and we say, okay, where in the asteroid belt did that come from? And so you have to kind of trace these kinds of things backwards to try and figure out what family of asteroids it's like and, and where it may have come from in, in the asteroid belt. Okay, I think we won't talk about this one too, too much. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit more about Bennu. So Bennu is what's called an Apollo asteroid. So this is an asteroid that um, crosses the, the Earth's orbit um, and spends most of its time, well, Bennu spends most of its time between Earth and Mars, but it, but it does cross uh, the Earth's orbit. There are different classes too, uh, the Amors and the Atons, um, just depends whether they stay completely outside the Earth's orbit or completely inside the Earth's orbit. So Bennu is an Apollo asteroid. When we classify asteroids, we typically do them by spectrometry because this is the thing we can do from the Earth. So this is these are all little cartoons, and so you should read them as um, wavelength of reflected light on, the, on the, uh, the little axis, and the vertical axis is the amount of light that gets reflected off them. So there are three main types of asteroids you'll, you'll often hear about, and those are stony ones. So these are things that are a lot of silicates and, and might have reflectivities, kind of like the picture behind me. Um, there's the carbonaceous ones like Bennu. These are the very dark ones with lots of carbon compounds. And then there's the metallic ones. And then those are further broken down um, like, like we have here. So um, Bennu is a, a B class circled here. So it means that it reflects a little bit more blue light than red light. But when we went to Bennu, um, some of the distinctions here are often a little bit uh, challenging from the, from the Earth. Um, but the B class uh, asteroid here 
is we'd never really been to before. So this was one of the reasons why um, Bennu was chosen along with it being just a general carbonaceous asteroid, which we wanted to know how many organics, how much water was involved or, or uh, how much water was still um, there in, in, uh, in the asteroid from a resource standpoint. Um, okay. Uh, so can someone tell me, can you hear that, the, the sound I just played, the music or not? You couldn't hear it at all. Let me try again. No, it's no. quiet, Mike. All right. I wonder if there's a way to do that in Zoom. Uh, just give me a second. Maybe we can make it happen here. All right. Well, maybe it's mostly music anyway. This is just talking about the need for grabbing a sample for laboratory analysis. There's no narration. Yeah, I don't know how to, never given this one on Zoom, sorry. All right, I think the rest is a duplicate. Um, yeah, apologies for that. I've not given this uh, presentation over Zoom like this. And I think my speakerphone here, uh, because it's actually, I could hear it fine. Um, it cuts out the music, so there's uh, the narration, so there's no, no feedback. But uh, essentially it's, um, we've, we've talked about everything that was in the narration. So I figure out how to get out of here. We'll... Okay, a little bit more about why Ben and what we knew before we went there. Um, so this is what we thought Bennu was like before we left the Earth. This is from a radar model from mostly from Arecibo, which is now no longer. If any of you saw what happened to Arecibo with the when it uh, when it collapsed. Um, so this is about, so Bennu is about 500 meters in diameter. Uh, this model is about 20 meters in resolution. We knew it had an equatorial bulge. We knew it spun at about 4.3 hours uh, period. And we knew that it was very dark with an albedo of about 4%. We also studied how well it uh, heated and cooled. And we thought that we would have a very sandy beach, lots of locations where there would be uh, sort of 25 meter areas where we would have a sandy beach and lots of regular. So how else did we pick Bennu? Well, we knew about half a million asteroids, about 7,000 of them were near Earth asteroids. We wanted to get a sample back that got us down to about 192. Then we needed them all to have a large enough diameter and a large enough mass so that we could orbit them. So that was about a 200 meter diameter that gets you down to 26. Five of them were these C-class asteroids. So we chose from five and we got to Bennu. So rapidly we got from 500 million to, to five. 
Uh, I'm going to skip over this because I want to give you lots of time for questions. Okay, so back to the OSIRIS-REx laser altimeter. Where did this come from? You always have a challenge when you're putting an instrument together. You know, it's supposed to be cool and do all this new stuff, and, and, but it's supposed to be uh, really low risk to develop, even though you've never developed one before. So you always have to play these games between, you know, what's called heritage and coolness and scientific return. So we did have a little bit of heritage. There were a couple of missions that we did before. Uh, one which Don talked about, which was the first missions Canada sent to Mars, which is a project I started and then led from the engineering, uh, the technical side of things. And this was um, again, a laser ranger, but this one provided profiles. So it wasn't just time to a single return, but actually time for, you know, to measure the uh, structure of clouds and dust in the Mars atmosphere, we actually uh, discovered it's snowing on, on Mars in 2008. So that was a pretty cool Canadian discovery to see it snowing on Mars with this LIDAR. That actually gave us our 100 hertz laser. It was very uh, essentially the same laser, except uh, here it's shown green for Phoenix uh, because it was green, uh, but we got it green by what's called frequency doubling it. So we took the doubler out because we didn't need it to be green. And, and that laser was the, the one that was designed for Phoenix. And then we had another type of laser and also a two axis scanning mirror and something was, was very much the basis for the rest of OLA. And it flew on a US Air Force experimental satellite called XSS-11, which was probably more meant to scan other satellites and things in orbit. We'll leave it there. So this is what our mission looked like. This was the plan before we got there and it really was quite uh, similar with, except for the addition of a couple extra uh, phases. So I'll, I'll, I'll give you the, the, the whole sense of it. Um, there was a, this is maybe related to the question that was asked before. How much time do I have? I don't wanna keep everyone too long. I would say, you know, you maybe could wrap in about say 15, 20 minutes. All right, Mike, no was that possible? Yep. Um, so there's one, so there was an approach phase here as we first saw Bennu as a spot and started getting closer that Ola didn't operate in, but the other instruments did, the cameras and the spectrometers. So that's when we first got our, um, our uh, measurements from there. So that's, you know, tens of kilometers out. As we got to seven kilometers, we did them series of passes over the North Pole, the South Pole, and the equator of Bennu. I'll show you some data from that. Then we got into five kilometers and we later added some three and a half kilometer stations. And these, are, these were almost, you couldn't really station keep, but you can think of them as station keeping uh, stations where we nodded the spacecraft up and down and we moved the Ola mirror sideways and we got a global model of, the first global model of Bennu um, with Ola. We inserted a couple of other um, phases here at kind of the three kilometer range as well. Um, I probably won't show you any data. I think the data we got from what's called the orbital B phase was the coolest data. And again, that's the model behind me. So as we got into, it says 750 meters here, we were actually closer to 700 meters from the surface. We started really using this 10 kilohertz laser. And this is another one of those places like the record player that aged me, but we moved the, the mirror almost like an old cathode ray tube TV. So we didn't fly back, we, we scanned in this square raster pattern. Um, and we took five and a half minute postage stamp 3D models of, of the surface of Bennu that were kind of on the order of 100 meters by 100 meters on the surface of this 500 meter diameter object. Um, and then we had to piece all those together. And then we had what's called reconnaissance phase. And this is where we flew in very close to the surface to try and get the best, the highest resolution imagery and topography of the proposed sampling sites as possible. So a small area of Bennu where we wanted to touch the surface. Uh, not talk too much about this. Um, here's the inside of the optics of what's called the engineering model. So not the model that flew, but the prototype that was done before that. And here you can see the 
two axis scanning mirror. So above that gold mirror um, would be the, that uh, window that I showed you on the previous uh, picture where you could see the black honeycomb. The window's right above that. So the received light goes into the screen, reflects off that mirror, goes left in this image off that off axis parabolic mirror, which makes it go up in this image off another mirror and then to the left to the actual detector. So that's, that's the path. Um, the, you can see two holes in that gold mirror. Um, and those two holes are actually where the lasers go out uh, of the mirror and into the, uh, and through the, the window um, to, to hit Bennu. So you have both, um, Actually, I misspoke a little bit. The holes you see are, are holes in that receiver, what's labeled the receiver off axis par parabolic mirror. And so the lasers come through that mirror and then reflect off that gold scanning mirror um, at, a, at a 90 degree angle and then through the mirror to Bennu and then back to the mirror and through the path I detected. So that's, that's what's inside. The two lasers are on the bottom of that unit. Um, the low energy laser is the 10 kilohertz one. So the pulse energies are smaller, but they happen uh, 100 times faster. And that high energy laser, that's the clone of the one that is sitting on the northern part of Mars right now um, on the Phoenix, what's left of the Phoenix lander. This is how we calibrated OLA. So this is, an, uh, this is actually a two axis scan that was done in the laboratory at, at MDA who actually uh, did the detailed design and, and built OLA. So these targets were used to, to try and connect the physical geometry, the geometry of reality with the mirror geometry um, so that we could actually take the coordinates of the mirror and, and understand exactly where the laser was pointing and where our measurements were coming from. All right, a few more uh, pictures here. This is actually the spacecraft being integrated at Lockheed Martin. So you can see the science deck on the top. I don't think you can see Ola in this picture. It's behind the solar array to the right. Um, this is a picture of the launch from the Cape. Uh, so this is always a fun thing to go to. Um, this was about a week or so after there was a big SpaceX uh, explosion. And, and so there was some concern about damage to this uh, spacecraft, this rocket that was already on the, on the pad when that explosion happened, but everything uh, turned out to be okay. And uh, the launch went off as planned. Um, so we launched in 2016, we didn't get to Bennu until the end of 2018. And that's really just because this is a, usually these things are slow because you're trying to uh, maximize the, or minimize the amount of fuel you use. So we actually did a close return, a close pass of earth to steal a little bit of the earth's energy. Um, and then we slowly caught up uh, and rendezvoused with, with Bennu. So here we go, we're going for our Earth, oh, Earth gravity assist right here. Change the trajectory, get a little more speed. And then we caught up to, to Bennu. All right, um, we won't go into all the details here, but this is what I showed you before. The first time OLA was turned on, preliminary survey. We did, um, turned out to be three passes above the North Pole, one pass on the South Pole, and one pass on the um, equator. We expected to get a great deal of measurements, and this is what we got, something, I, I should have this number, it seems like the distant past almost uh, less than a percent of what we got. So we were, we were, um, so we had an operating instrument, we got measurements, 
Uh, Ola was actually able to do what it was supposed to do at this phase, which was mostly to try and put a scale to the camera-based uh, shape and size of, of Bennu. Uh, but there was a lot of question marks about why we got less measurements than we expected. We did see some surprises though. I saw three uh, returns that were off the surface of Bennu that could have been noise, instrument noise, but they were in suspicious locations. And when I did a statistical analysis, they looked a little anomalous uh, in terms of uh, where they were in relation to Bennu and, and where I would have expected a, a normal, you know, a normal statistical distribution of noise returns. So I spent a lot of time looking in camera images, trying to find these objects that I thought were orbiting Bennu or in close proximity to Bennu, but there were no camera images um, that were, were taken. Um, and it wasn't until a few months later, there were some camera images that showed that Bennu had a lot of particles that had been ejected off the surface and were orbiting. So I still maintain I was the first one to see it, but you know, arguing from statistics and noise, um, I'm on the paper, but uh, I didn't get the first author. How about that? Um, Now, I told you we expected Bennu to be a sandy beach. Uh, this is not a sandy beach. Bennu looks like that everywhere. So we went from expecting 25 meters of smooth sand place where we could get that tag device down to the surface of Bennu and blow our gas and collect our regolith and everything would be fine to where are we gonna find a place that spacecraft's gonna be safe and we can get that sampling device flat to the surface and how are we going to collect our 60 grams? So we went from looking for 25 meter areas to five meter areas. And these five meter areas necessitated a change of how we actually got the spacecraft to the surface. So we actually had to uh, use uh, camera images and model of Bennu and a model of the solar geometry so that you could um, anticipate where shadows would be. So you could track from the camera images by triangulation where the spacecraft was on its way down. So this caused uh, both, you know, myself and the working group that I was involved, that I was the deputy for led by uh, my colleague at Johns Hopkins University and the people doing the camera based shapes, a lot of extra work uh, to try and find safe locations for the spacecraft and to, and to make sure our topographic models were adequate for the spacecraft to actually use them to navigate to the surface. So we went from here, I would say, Ola being a nice to have to being almost a necessity. Um, this is our first global shape model we got from you know, the five kilometer range. So here we were, we kind of breathed a sigh of relief. You know, Ola started, Ola was providing the number of returns that we expected, or at least about that. Um, still haven't had time to really put pencil to paper and make sure this is true, but I think it was really the surface roughness of Bennu that, that uh, impacted our, our range assessments. Um, I'm gonna have to put that in the, in the TBD range. So here I've just false colored this where the red is the largest, or is the, the greatest distance from the surface, it's from the center of the object and blue, uh, the deep blues are closer to the center of the object. One thing to, you know, where what makes asteroids very um, interesting is um, actually the, the part that's furthest to so the equator is actually the lowest part of the asteroid. So, you know, on, on Earth, we have the, the spin of the Earth does change what we all weigh, uh, depending where we are on the Earth. But on, on this asteroid, the, the acceleration due to the spin is of the same order as the acceleration due to gravity. So if things were smooth and you dropped a marble at the North Pole, it would roll to the equator, even though the equator is further from the center of the asteroid than the North Pole is. Okay, so as we got to uh, this orbital B, you know, 700 meters from the surface. Oh, maybe I have some transitions here that I usually turn off. Um, I told you we created these uh, postage stamps. 
100 meters here, 120 meters by 120 meters. They took about five and a half uh, minutes to take. And this is an example of one of them on the top right. This is a single OLA scan. And the, the level of topographic detail there is just like, it just blew us away. It's, it's, it operated the way I had in my head, you know, a decade before. But I think Bennu was a lot more interesting. And when you see it, it was just absolutely stunning. So what we did is we took um, all of these scans, which we had something on the order of 900 of them. And uh, almost, I think we had 2.7 billion measurements. Of, and we overlapped them all and registered them in a self-consistent way to create a global model. So you can see that the, the colored ones here on the bottom give you an idea of how we match them up. And you can just think of all of these overlapping ones where we, we kind of let them all flex until they were all self-consistent and we had this model that's behind me. Although it wasn't quite that uh, simple. Reason why it wasn't quite that simple is uh, this is a comparison of the camera-based shape model with the OLA-based shape model. And so here you'll notice a couple of things. You'll notice that all of the rocks, the OLA model is higher than the camera-based model. So the deep red means OLA is higher. The deep blue means lower. So the, the, the small features, this is, this is correct because OLA gives, um, essentially measures reality. The way the camera-based shape modeling works, it, it's, it's phenomenal, um, but it, it tends to smooth out the boulders and, and underestimate the crater sizes. So, so that's correct, but what's not correct is we're a little narrow on the equator and we're a little too tall at the poles. So we ended up doing a lot of work. Uh, it really took, I think, almost a year for us to clean all this up. Somewhere along the way, the Ola mirror changed its calibration. So we don't know if this was a change, really, or whether it was a mistake in, in ground-based calibration. We haven't been able to find that. Um, we have some guesses as to why the calibration was not what we expected. Um, but Still, they're just guesses, but we were able to uh, correct for this by um, making our data all self-consistent with one another, but it took a fair bit of work. And this is a 20 centimeter, actually this one might be a 40 centimeter model. So you've got a 500 meter diameter object and we have measurements. I think I'm now believing them down to the 10 centimeter level across the whole object. So this is a, I, I think we've applied for a Guinness World Record for this one for the most um, well measured object in the solar system. So we, we don't have Earth to 10 centimeters. Um, so this is again 2.7 billion points. So when we, when I first put the plan for OLA together, the original estimate was we would get 300 million measurements. We got almost 10 times that. Um, unfortunately, we used this laser up and it, it failed before, almost before we were, the last time we wanted to use it, uh, the laser died. So um, I hesitate to call it a failure because we got 10 times the measurements that we wanted, but if it had just run for another 45 minutes, uh, we would have, had complete success through the, the whole mission. Um, so this gives you an idea of the, this is um, a little bit smooth, the LiDAR model. So there's the LiDAR model, there's a camera image. So you can see how much we're actually capturing of the object. Okay, I won't go too much into this. This is a paper that, uh, that I was a lead author on about, um, if you look, it's maybe not so apparent here, but the Northern hemisphere of Bennu and the Southern hemisphere, the Southern hemisphere is quite a bit more rounded. Uh, so we did a lot of investigation on that. And I wrote a paper that uh, hypothesized why that might be. So this is just the details of the paper. Um, I don't think we can, we need to talk about too much of that at this point. But I will say the, 
this data is going to keep a lot of people happy because we've mostly been uh, looking at it from a global perspective. Uh, we've just written, my, my colleague at Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Lab just uh, led a paper looking at the sample site with detailed topography. Um, so we've done things like looking at some boulder statistics and crater statistics, but we haven't looked at the geology of Bennu. You can see layering and rocks. You can like, it's just, the detail is utterly amazing. Um, never been anything like it before. This gives you a sense of uh, of some of the detail we have. You can you can kind of see the the level of morphology in the rocks. You can see there's scale bars on the uh, at least two of the images here. So this is kind of thing that keeps a geologist uh, just salivating. Bennu also has these north-south ridges. And so we were hypothesizing that, so I told you the other uh, thing like Yarkovsky was called YARP. So you can spin up these asteroids um, with that solar radiation effect. And as you spin it up, they can start to come apart. And um, one of our colleagues in, in Nice uh, has done a model that suggests that if the strength's right, you can actually I really cartooned it here, but you can actually have the asteroid come apart something, you know, in, in sort of quadrants like grapefruit slices. And as it would come apart, it would um, slow down and refigure a little bit and then come back together. And that coming back together uh, could create these ridges that we see in the model. So that was, that was really the uh, Cool part of the paper, and we have lots of supporting evidence to suggest that might be the case. And so, we so this is um, this model, the OLA model, uh, with some camera and spectroscopy data integrated on top of it. So it's really a contribution of the main instruments on uh, the Osiris Rex mission. And uh, Cover of Science was a pretty cool place to to get your data. Just wanted to give you a little bit of the sample site. So um, you can see this is still not a very smooth sample site. The sample sites where we could have some confidence of getting a sample were uh, ended up being craters. So I'll just show you the movie of what actually happened when we sampled. So you can see it's still a fairly rough area. The crater here, it's about, it's on the order of five meters in diameter. Spacecraft navigation team did a wonderful job. The, that mapping or the navigation approach that I was telling you spent, we spent a lot of time um, doing worked really well. So this is our topography with imagery wrapped over top of it. So again, you get a sense of the detail um, and the morphology of the rocks and how rough that sampling site is. Um, Here's another visualization. There is no narration that you're missing here. Um, again, topography with imagery wrapped on it so you can get a sense of the albedo. So this is the whole touch and go thing. So again, this is a cartoon, but it's going to switch. This is real imagery. So lots of regolith. The surface was had a lot less strength than we expected. I haven't seen the latest numbers, but I think we penetrated, you know, tens of centimeters into the surface. Um, we got so much material that those mylar flaps wouldn't close, and we were shedding material uh, when we got back into orbit of the asteroid. We actually decided not to do that measurement of the moment of inertia because we thought it would just shed more material. So the decision was made just to uh, stow it and bring it home, uh, hoping that we got the probably, you know, more than a kilo, kilogram of material that we, uh, we think we got. So very successful mission. Um, 
just wanted to change this little song here because it's missing something important. And that's the end of my talk. That's wonderful. Thank you, Mike. That's that's a fantastic way to finish as well. Um, <clears throat> there were a number of uh, questions, some of which you covered, but the last question that came in, I think uh, was a good one to maybe kick off with. And that is, you know, what would you say were the major sort of breakthrough discoveries, if you like, um, that would interest, you know, your average sort of lay person um, besides the sample coming back, which obviously is a big part of the mission, getting that back on Earth um, uncontaminated because everything we sample from outer space is all contaminated by terrestrial contaminants. But this will be the first time we have a sample um, that's uncontaminated. Besides that, what would you say are the major um, outcomes? Um, yeah, I, I guess I've never been asked that question quite that way before. You know, I would say this mission, you know, is, is, is there anything sort of at, at the level that, you know, you could explain it to a five-year-old and they would go, wow, that's cool. Um, you know, which is usually the way I interpret a question like that. Like what's, what's something that's really easy to explain. It's really, uh, Cool, and I, I, I guess I'm not sure about that. Um, I think this mission had so many discoveries, but they're all at the level of, hey, we didn't expect to have all these particles, you know, orbiting the asteroid. We don't really, didn't really expect the strength of the surface of the asteroid to be that low. We're still thinking about that. Um, you know, they're, they're kind of at that sort of detail level. There's just a huge number of them and probably forgetting something at the level that you're looking for, but I, I don't have it at the top of my head. Right now. It is not landing on such a small object so distant from the earth. Is that already not a pretty major accomplishment? Well, it's, it, yeah, in terms of the technology, it's a major accomplishment. We actually do have a Guinness Book of World Records for the, the uh, smallest radius orbit around anything, which is that sort of 700 meter orbit. So I, I suppose, um, you know, that's, that's got the cool factor for, for the kids, but it's not a scientific discovery. It's a technical achievement. I right. think a little more on the scientific discovery side. Um, so if anyone has a question, just take yourself off mute and uh, feel free to ask Mike. We sang this hymn on Sunday, by the way, so. <laughs> Mike, if, I, if you don't mind me asking, can you hear me okay? I can. Okay, wonderful presentation and, and, and congratulations on the success of your project. It's very amazing. Um, I just have a question regarding the actual. Is that, is that, is that the Rob I know or not? No, probably not. <laughs> but, I, I, know, um, I know a Rob Clement, so. Oh, do you? Oh, okay, wonderful. Um, Geograph, like geologically speaking, and actually the materials that's on the asteroid in terms of the elements and the, the actual, yeah, on the periodic table, do you think there's going to be any new discovery when you actually sample and investigate the sample? And then my next question would be, I think on the, Mo the, the Mars programs, they've used a um, type of satellite technology that actually drills into the sample and they use this, some type of um, spectrometer or whatever it is, they analyze the actual substance and they send back the report. Uh, my guess is just a budgeting issue or why would there be not be the instrumentation built in with this project? Okay, so Thank maybe you, I'll, I'll, I'll start with the, I think there are sort of three questions there. Um, so you, you might need to, uh, because I'm now an absent-minded professor, I might forget them all before I get to them. Um, in terms of your, okay, drilling is a lot easier on Mars and asteroids. So um, you, you can, you know, this is a microgravity environment. So if you actually want to drill into the surface and land, you, you have to figure out how you're going to keep yourself on the surface <laughs> in this microgravity environment. And then if you actually want to exert on the for force on the surface, like they did to drill into the surface of Mars, <coughs> excuse me, then you, 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 you need a way to 
you know, exert an opposite force. Um, so it's much more challenging actually to drill on an asteroid, you know, and we didn't have Bruce Willis to send, so um, that didn't work either. <laughs> and you'll note that if you've been following the latest, uh, the um, uh, InSight Mars mission, uh, you know, they have had their challenges with drilling too. I have worked on some concepts for drilling on Mars and it's not that easy, but it really is a different problem because of the microgravity environment. Now, in terms of why they analyze everything there and we're bringing a sample back, um, that's, it's not really that they have better instruments than we do, it's they don't have a choice. So, you know, there's been a long, well, one of the things that the, um, uh, whatever the name of the last rover is that, that I've, I've lost, it's, it's meant to go and collect some samples for um, a Mars sample return. So they wanna bring pieces of Mars back because whatever we do, the, the instruments we have in the laboratory are much more capable of what we can design for space flight. But you know, because we're operating in a microgravity environment, it's so much easier to get a sample back from an asteroid to Earth than it is to get out of the Mars gravity well. So, so we're really in a better position than, than they are from a Mars perspective. The costs of Mars sample return are going to be uh, more, I would guess more than 10 times what our entire mission costs just to bring samples back from Mars. And then once you get the samples back, you have this um, issue called planetary protection. So you can think of the movie, The Andromeda Strain, right? So samples from the moon or samples from an asteroid, we have absolutely no concern about bringing anything that could be potentially harmful to humans back. But from Mars, you have to treat this like a biohazard. Um, so even the costs of dealing with this um, from, from a safety perspective when it comes back uh, to Earth is uh, much more challenging and much more expensive from Mars. We just have to worry about uh, not contaminating this sample from, from Earth and from our own analyses. And, and they have to worry about that, plus not, uh, not allowing anything that might escape that, that could be harmful to us. Did I miss still a question there? I told you I might. Yeah, that's, a, that's an amazing answer. Thank you. That's very insightful. I didn't think of many of those things. But the last question I had, Mike, was in regards to the discovery potentially of any unknown elements um, on the periodic table that may be added because of the investigation of the sample that we're bringing back from the asteroid. Yeah, I don't, I don't, there won't be a unknown elements. It's really a question of, you know, what the mineralogy is, what kind of organics are, are there, because, you know, we, we know there are a lot of organic compounds in space, but we don't know the extent of them. We can measure some in our ground-based telescopes, but we, we don't really have that information from, from asteroids. We, don't, we know we've seen in the spectral data that there, there's water on Bennu. We don't really know how much. All of that information helps us not, not only to understand how the asteroid population might have impacted the Earth from the point of view of water and organics, but it also helps us to, to back tell the story of the asteroid and how that asteroid got there, how it evolved. Uh, many of these asteroids, so this is a big rubble pile. Um, so many of these asteroids would have, um, you know, could have disrupted and then reformed. And, and so a lot of this is about telling the puzzle of how that asteroid, how it formed, um, where it came from the asteroid belt, how it got uh, moved into its present orbit, and what's happened to it along the way in terms of its global and, and you know, local surface evolution. Should I look in the chat or? We... Mike, when you were uh, working on the project, did you spend much time working with uh, people in, in Florida or NASA or other, other parts of NASA or were you mostly just working within your own team? Um, so, so we had a Canadian science team. We had Canadian industry team. The Canadian industry team was uh, led by uh, MDA where I used to work in Brampton, had Teledyne Optech. Um, 
which is a company that actually came out of York University at, at one point and now is a world leader in LiDAR systems. Um, so it, they were the main industrial contractors. Um, the spacecraft was built by Lockheed Martin in Littleton, so near Denver. Um, the, the mission was led, so it was a, what's called a principal investigator led mission. So it was uh, led by a professor at University of Arizona. Um, and that's where the, the contact came because the Phoenix mission uh, was also uh, led out of the University of Arizona. So then when they were putting this mission together, they, they called me to see what we could do for, for, for this mission. Um, the NASA center, there's usually a NASA center involved was Goddard Sp Space Flight Center in Maryland. Um, so those would be uh, where some of the other instruments came from, the cameras, University of Arizona, the, the thermal spectrometer, Arizona State, the visible spectrometer, Goddard. Um, so that, those are the main players. We had a chap in the chapter, uh, Mike, uh, Paul LaRock, I'm sure you know him. He worked at MDA as well. Um, not well. Not well. I know the name though. You know of him, okay. Yeah, he was on a couple of our. Uh, he's been to a couple of our meetings and uh, uh, seemed very knowledgeable. Uh, when we mentioned that you were coming, he uh, he knew quite a bit about OLA. <clears throat> Anyone else with any questions for Mike? Hey, Mike, this is Joe. Yeah, I'm actually in Florida. Sorry. <laughs> okay, we got two, but Joe, you go ahead first. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so I want to applaud you and your efforts there, Mike. Um, I actually was curious regarding the imagery was captured, um, which I did post actually in chat. As far as clarity, um, I'm sure it was probably a good challenge to gather um, the imagery with all the analyses done to get the actual uh, 3D models and so forth to find out how smooth or bumpy or rocky the actual uh, collection of information was. Um, were the contingencies of vibrations and or I guess space error per se um, also in consideration for what was gathered? Um, so if I understand your question, how did we have confidence in that the that we were properly characterizing the sample site from the point of view of the sampling and the space and the safety of that sampling. Is that a way to interpret your question? That and the cameras that were used, I know are laser based. You did give us the visual, which is actually excellent to see that was using mirrors. Yeah. Okay, but because so of the movement of the modules and so forth, yeah, because how it traveled and had to use the Earth's gravity to catch up with the actual asteroid, which got me kind of curious in that area. Yes. Okay. So, um, one of the fortunate things about um, so th so this is a uh, well I, I've kind of meshed it but this is one Ola scan and you can see the level of detail here is of of a, a mountain I, I showed you actually with a global model but um, the global model is more complexities but we took a scan like this and then we have camera images you know that are single images of the same location. So we can match these things up and we can tell that the, the, the mirror is doing the right thing at this level because the correspondence between, you know, all of these individual rocks over this span and, and those same rocks in the camera images were, was extremely good. You know, the, the issues that I, that took us longer to sort out were, were sort of, you know, two meters on 500 meters, and they didn't really appear at the, the level of a single scan. And it was at these single scans that we were using to, to assess the, the sample site and, and do the, the kind of risky, um, the assessment of risks of the actual critical operations. The global models are, were more important from a science perspective, and we had a little more time to figure out what was going on and get those right. But they, that's where all the work was. Did I answer your question? So it was really the comparing the camera images with the LIDAR scans uh, gave us high confidence. Yeah, I guess we haven't really achieved yet as far as technology to do video capture due to the uh, travel time, delays and so forth, where it has to be just instances, right? Not sure I'm following your question. 
Um, well, because video capture obviously be more streamed versus just instantaneous captures or just like segments as we're referring to that we haven't really achieved that level yet. Well, from I, I mean, we we certainly could have taken you know movies at any point along. You just have to store the data on the spacecraft and you know send it down at at leisure. You can't do it really real time. Um, but, but if it was useful, we we could have done that. It, it just ends up being that you you don't want um, it's not very usual that you want you know speed of of capture and real time images. You really want detail and to know where the spacecraft is and where it's pointed and where the asteroid is when you've taken that detail. So it, it ends up usually the not that we can't do it, but it's the trade-off doesn't work to where that's a beneficial thing to do. That's a very justifiable answer. Thank you. <laughs> very realistic. <laughs> Someone else had a question? I have a quick question. Yeah, maybe sorry, a bit, uh, oh. Go ahead, John. Uh, yeah, maybe a bit silly, but as a result of your mission, did you actually deflect the trajectory of Bennu? Well, presumably you did, but uh, ever so tiny. Um, and do, they, do you bother to calculate that, you know, and, and, and maybe is there a chance you could deflect it and cause, an, you know, it to hit Earth as a result? Yeah, well, <laughs> I, I didn't calculate it, but I'm sure someone did because we get this question a lot. Oh, really? Uh, but, you know, the, the plan was something like five newtons of force for five seconds, you know, yeah. on, on this large object. So in terms of any significant deflection, it's just not... Uh, nothing. Yeah, nothing. And what's the time lag, uh, Mike, from from data capture to actual seeing it on well, Earth? When we did the tag, uh, if memory serves, it was on the order of what a usual Mars mission is. So that's sort of 15 minute kind of number. Okay, so typical. Far from instantaneous. Yeah, it just depended where where we were in the relative orbits, but but it was it was all that kind of number. Mike, you mentioned that one of the reasons you chose this asteroid is because of possibility of organic compounds. Did you find any anything that would indicate there are organic compounds? Um, I can't remember if we had any spectral data. We had lots of water, um, but you know, I think we're all expecting there's organic compounds in those returned samples. Um, so I, I can't definitively answer your question because I haven't looked at the, it's not been where my focus is. And I've, we, we've, uh, I'm, I'm already behind on the stuff I'm responsible for. So. <laughs> <laughs> One I've of the- been, I've been behind since it seems like the beginning of the mission. <laughs> <laughs> it's a common, uh, I think, question that, uh, you know, the, the popular press certainly has, lay people have, and that is, you know, life life from space and so forth. And so these kinds of missions, that's that's a burning question that people have, you know, is what's the sample? What does the sample got in it now? Is it is it got complex, uh, you know, biomolecules? Because if it does, then obviously, you know, there's nothing special about Earth. That whole, um, you know, offshoring the problem of the origin of life. Um, and... Uh, I noticed in the one movie that you played, Mike, there was a couple of molecules of adenine and guanine, which of course are components of DNA. So, you know, th that kind of thinking, I think, is what's behind uh, those questions and why the sample return will be so important to see what's really in there. Um, you mentioned water a few times. How would the water be, like, how would it be bound given that it's in a vacuum? It can't be surface water or anything like that. It must be bound in the mineral in some way, yes? Yeah, that's right, yeah. Okay. Great. Um, but, and by the representation you gave, though, it showed um, the module actually reaching Bennu itself, utilizing even the Earth's gravity just to get more trajectory to get towards their trajectory to get there. Um, I can't remember if you did mention it. Well, it was like a six month travel or eight month travel before it actually reached it? 
we launched in September of 2016, and so it was about two months, two years. Uh, oh, two years! Gosh, I totally messed that right. <laughs> because the thing was traveling quite quickly, right? So, because it was actually going faster, I think, than the Earth was, because it circled around the Earth twice before it reached it, right? Yeah, we stole a little energy from the Earth to catch up to Bennu, um, but always these these things you could go much faster but you have to use a lot more fuel and using a lot more fuel means a bigger spacecraft more mass to launch and it mm -hmm. just doesn't work out it's the same way a mars mission is typically you know eight or nine months to get to, to mars you could get there faster if you want to burn a lot more fuel uh, but we we don't how, how did the spacecraft maneuver at position mike like what did it use for fuel and thrusters <laughs> Just chemical thrusters, um, and then it has you know, star trackers, and then they track it from the uh, deep space network to, to understand its position and its velocity. Um, so it's it, it was quite a standard mission from that perspective. Okay. Cool. There there have been missions that use use ion thrusters. This was not one of them. This was quite conventional. Oh, so they don't actually use the uh, air jets. Um... For maneuverability, it's been changed. I've been out of touch as far as the modules, how they actually maneuver anymore. Uh, it's, it's all hydrazine. Okay. Well, I have one question about um, what, what's the bandwidth of the downlink and then the uplink, and can you control it? Can you send new software to it, etc.? I don't have those numbers off the top of my head, but the bandwidth is dependent on the distance between Earth and the spacecraft. So it changed right. throughout the mission. So early in the mission, we had almost as much bandwidth as we could use in terms of sending data back. Uh, later on, it got much more constrained. Um, I want to say it was between 300 and a megabit per second kind of numbers, 300 kilobits mm -hmm. and a megabit per second. But don't quote me on that. And that's bi-directional? That was down. I don't know the up. Okay. Uh, you know, there's a lot less data going up. So. Right. Still impressive for the speed and distance, though. That's better than dial-up. <laughs> 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 really? <laughs> For those of us that can remember. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We we sent a lot of data down. So uh, let me just think a minute. So if we got 3 billion measurements, and then so. We probably sent 100 gigabytes of data mm. down, just our instrument. That's a great deal. Well, still impressive, though. Still impressive. Okay, well, the chat's gone quiet, and I think we're... We've got one much... question still. Oh, another question. Um, Ian, go ahead. Yeah. When you use the term organics, what exactly do you mean? Oh, you should ask Don. He's the biologist guy. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, Don. Sage is yours. <laughs> well, it's, it's just basically any carbon, carbon-based uh, molecule, typically with carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, are, are considered organics. So they could be simple. Um, something as simple as you know acid aldehyde, or you know something like that, or more complex, longer chain carbons. Um, For all kinds of PAHs, you know, you can see with telescope observations. So that's the. So those are. PAHs are polyaromatic hydrocarbons, so things like benzene and things like that are the basis of those. So there's uh, no chemicals. assumption these came from organic systems? Uh, I guess it depends what you, if you mean there's no assumption that they came from life, that, is that what you mean? Then I think that's yes. the case. The question is, you know, how they form, which ones form uh, in deep space, and and which ones have a, a life on an asteroid, mm -hmm. and what the abundance is. Thank you. Sorry, I got you back, Don. But yeah, no worries. Your 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 uh, your organic chemistry is much better than mine. 
Well, it does bring the curiosity, though, of uh, what was brought up earlier <clears throat> as far as any other elements that I think Robert brought up, I guess, is just really what we're looking for versus what's actually available to what we actually have knowledge on. It can define that further, even on this asteroid or any other body or mass that's found in space, right? Yeah, well, the, I think the problem with elements, new elements, is that, you know, you're talking about expanding the periodic table, which we already know that the higher end numbers of the periodic table are already synthetic, um, you know, elements. There's only, I think, 92 naturally occurring elements um, on the periodic table. So unless we're talking about a completely different form of physics, um, the physics of everywhere we look in our universe is, is all based on the periodic table. So it's it's not um, it's not something that would be considered a new a new element, um, new compounds, yes, but not a new element. Yeah, yeah. The the elemental questions are how much of each one is there. You know, it's it's a chemistry question, not are there any new ones. That makes very good sense. That's very logical to go with, because you're you're correct on compounding it itself can make it unique depending on how they are combined. So I can agree with that one. Yeah. Thank you. A good presentation, guys. I mean, I'm really actually impressed. Very good. Glad you enjoyed it. So let me let me just say thank you to Mike uh, for taking the time. Believe me, I, I have some sense of how busy he is because I know how hard it was to get a hold of him. But uh, he is a very busy guy. And, uh, you know, just a little bit of insight into why that might be. Uh, in case you missed it or in case you don't appreciate it, um, to be on the cover of nature and on the cover of science is um, very, very impressive. And uh, you don't get on those the covers of those journals unless you've done something truly remarkable in the science world. So congratulations uh, to you, Mike, for, for, the, for the mission. You're part of the mission and, and uh, the great success that you had. And uh, we're grateful to hear uh, you know, this kind of this, you know, amazing, pardon the pun, but stellar work, um, at least asteroid work anyway. Uh, and, uh, and knowing that, you know, you're someone who, you know, walks the talk when it comes to his faith and, and um, you work in an environment where it's uh, sometimes hostile to that. So thank you again for, uh, for everything you, you, you provided uh, to us tonight for taking you know the time. That the, the physical sciences, I think, has a lot more people of faith than in some of the areas of the university, right? Because we understand the limits of science. So. <laughs> well put, well put. So thanks, everyone, for uh, joining tonight. We did record this. Uh, Bruno, did you want to make any closing remarks? I think you're on yeah. mute, Bruno. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you everyone for coming. Uh, this is a very interesting presentation that you did, Mike. Um, and we'll join, we'll see you all next month. We're going to show a video, uh, a Q&A that uh, Hugh Ross did with uh, Jeff Zwierink, talking about UFOs and various other topics as well. So I hope you can join us uh, next month. Fantastic. And Mike, I'm going to follow up with you uh, on our discussion about uh, possibly uh, getting more involved uh, with RTB at the uh, at the head office. So I'll get it. I'll send you an email. All right. Blessings, everyone. Thank you so Good much. Good night. Take care. Good night. Thanks so Good much, night, Mike. Guys. And Thank you. Awesome. Good night. Thank you. Good night.